Welcome to Light Over Heat with Professor David Yamani. This is a bonus episode in which I'm going to give away a copy of Jennifer Carlson's new book, and I'm also going to read the review I wrote of that book. So I received a copy of this book to review for the professional journal International Sociology Reviews, but I also bought an extra copy of the book even before I received that review copy. And so I'm going to give away my extra copy. I asked people on Twitter and Instagram to tag someone they thought would be interested in the book. I've done that drawing. I'll cut to that. And then after I'm finished, I will cut to a review that I wrote of this book for International Sociology Reviews. It's posted already on my blog, but I want to read that here for people who don't access my ideas in writing or who prefer to hear the dulcet tones of my voice reading the review to them. So I have a random uh, number generator set up. I have the entrance 1 to 35 in an Excel spreadsheet. So I'll just generate a number here and we'll see who the lucky winner is. Number 17. This is someone who I don't know, uh, but Jonathan Kammer, congratulations. You have won a copy. I'm going to be in touch with you to try to send you this book. And I also will select a few other names as backups in case I can't reach you. So I was only given 1500 words to review this book which isn't much, but as with all of Jennifer Carlson's work, I'll be engaging her ideas here for the years to come. But for now, here's what I have to say about it. Judging from the regular inquiries I receive from international media, a robust civilian gun culture is enigmatic outside the United States, or at least the particular civilian gun culture of the United States is. As the interdisciplinary study of guns shows, it is enigmatic to many Americans as well. In the growing field of gun studies, MacArthur Foundation certified genius Jennifer Carlson holds a singular position at the top. Merchants of the Right follows her pathbreaking studies of mostly white men who publicly carry guns in the context of socioeconomic decline in her book Citizen Protectors from 2015, and the racial politics of gun rights through the prism of law enforcement in her 2020 book, Policing the Second Amendment. Merchants of the Right uses the thoughts of gun retailers during the COVID-19 pandemic buying spree as a window onto the politics of guns and understands the politics of guns as a microcosm of right-leaning politics more general, generally. The titular merchants here are 50 gun sellers in four states, Arizona, California, Florida, and Michigan, that Carlson interviewed from April to August 2020. Of these, 84% self-identified as some variety of politically conservative, including Republican, Libertarian, Constitutionalist, and Conservative Christian. Hence the book's title, Merchants of the Right, these individuals do not only peddle guns, but a conservative political imagination that has dire consequences for democracy itself, as Carlson argues in Chapter 4. In a more normative and speculative conclusion, Carlson considers the implications of her study for the future of democracy in America. Drawing on Swidler's toolkit theory, Carlson devotes one chapter to each of three primary civic tools that constitute gun sellers' political imaginations. Armed individualism in chapter one, conspiracism in chapter two, and partisanship in chapter three. Safety and security are universal human concerns. Carlson's interviews with gun sellers show how this concern is interpreted through the lens of conservative politics. Armed individualism turns attention away from collective solutions to the problem of security and towards personal responsibility. Rooted in settler colonialism and chattel slavery, this quote-unquote gun-centric sensibility gets updated throughout American history. In Citizen Protectors, Carlson put the most recent incarnation in the context 
of the rise of neoliberalism. Others have used the term responsabilization to characterize this ethos. As COVID-19 pandemic amplified concerns for safety and security, many sought to alleviate those concerns by purchasing firearms. In the same way that many people became preppers during the coronavirus pandemic, hoarding toilet paper, cleaning wipes, and hand sanitizer, gun buyers stocked their arsenals, or in many cases, began new ones. As a result, Carlson's gun sellers felt vindicated in their view of armed individualism as a mechanism of control in times of profound uncertainty. The self-reliance that firearms achieve through force is complemented, according to Carlson, by conspiracism as a cultural tool that supports self-reliance through knowledge. Conspir conspiracism is part of a broader shift among conservatives towards distrust, not just of government, but all elites. This was particularly apparent in how Carlson's interviewees saw science during the coronavirus pandemic. In my own wanderings through American gun culture, I have seen this ethos as well, perhaps best reflected in the gun social media influencer who described the mask he was forced to wear to combat COVID as a, quote, Marxist face diaper. The treatment of partisanship was my favorite of the three toolkit chapters because other gun scholars and I have noted the changing face of gun owners evident in the great gun buying spree of 2020. New gun owners include more racialized minorities, women, LGBTQ people, people living in urban and suburban areas, and political liberals. Carlson's gun sellers often welcomed some of these new faces, but their extremely partisan conservative politics led them to draw the line at political diversity. Partisanship quote, provided a tool for gun sellers to police the boundaries of gun culture as conservative terrain, end quote. Which would be fine if the implications were limited to gun culture, but Carlson suggests that at its worst, gun sellers' partisanship drew a line around citizenship and political community that put their liberal political opponents on the outside. Now, to be clear, Carlson recognizes that Democrats are even more likely than Republicans to agree that the country would be better off if their political opponents, quote, just died, and that partisanship, therefore, is nonpartisan. Her empirical focus here is simply on one side of the two-way street of negative polarization. Now, taken together, these three civic tools inform the political imaginations of gun sellers. Carlson identifies three such imaginations. A libertarian imagination, which centers on a celebration of individual rights as the preferred remedy to social ills. An illiberal imagination, which rallies around an exclusionary vision of the people to resuscitate a bygone era of American democracy and an eclectic imagination, which bring together elements of conservative and liberal politics by emphasizing individual rights alongside collective responsibility. The overwhelming majority of Carlson's gun sellers reflect one of the two conservative political imaginations, that is libertarian or illiberal, that are at odds with liberal democracy's need for balancing the conflicting demands of political equality, social difference, individual liberty, and the common good. Carlson finds some hope, however, in the eclectic imagination shared by only three gun sellers who self-identified as left of center. Because these gun sellers straddled political worlds, conservative gun culture, and liberal gun political culture, they reflected the imagination that might develop among diverse, non-traditional, first-time gun buyers. And in the end, this suggests a path out of the crisis of democracy weighing on Carlson's mind. Carlson begins her concluding chapter on the democracy we deserve by adapting a line from Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Quote, there's a specter haunting American democracy, the specter of the gun owner, 
end quote. Carlson's case departs from Marx's, though, because Marx took the specter of communism to be a force for good, such that, quote, all the powers have entered into a holy alliance to exercise this specter, end quote. In the contemporary United States, gun owners are often seen as a destructive force, and the oppositional holy alliance includes the National Democratic Party, gun violence prevention advocacy groups, public health scholars, and generally those who construct a master narrative of democracy destroying right-wing politics like Ryan Boosie and Matthew Lacombe. On one reading, Carlson's book contributes to this master narrative. She argues that the 1970s merger of the National Rifle Association as a political force and the broader conservative political movement in the United States created a gun-centric politics that has played an essential role in the crisis of American democracy. This runs from, quote-unquote, democratically perverse outcomes, such as Congress not passing universal background checks despite popular support, to the, quote-unquote, illiberal mobilization of democracy in the assault on the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th, in which armed individualism, conspiracism, and partisanship were on full display, according to Carlson. Gun sellers' dominant libertarian and illiberal political imaginations are two particular responses to the challenges of living, quote, at the edge of democracy, the title of chapter four, but ultimately they push us closer to the edge. A second reading of Carlson's book, however, suggests a more nuanced view of American gun owners and gun culture. And this returns me to a significant empirical carve-out Carlson notes in her introduction. She writes, I focus on the conservative corner of American gun culture and gun politics, but the reality is that there is a great deal of diversity among gun owners and gun rights advocates that this book does not engage nor attempt to capture. Adding these diverse voices to the conversation about guns, gun culture, and gun politics in America provides a way forward, as Carlson hints, uh, at the end of chapter four and fully recognizes in the book's concluding paragraph. Those Americans who straddle political worlds, she writes, may be the best and last hope for reinvigorating democratic culture in the United States and forging the democracy we deserve, end quote. Why? Because those who straddle different worlds, like liberal gun owners, may be better able to embrace rather than eschew the conflict that is central to democracy. They may be more comfortable with the three-part alternative democracy-enhancing civic toolkit that Carlson outlines in the conclusion. First, she endorses political equanimity, a measured tolerance for uncertainty inherent in democracy over armed individuals' eager attempt at controlling it. Second, she promotes civic grace, political compassion towards one's fellow citizens and acceptance of their sincerity of political expression and legitimacy of political standing over exclusionary conspiracism's distrust. Third, she encourages social vulnerability, recognizing the frailty we share in common as humans and the grievances, losses, traumas, and suffering of fellow citizens over partisanship's limited view of the people. In the end, I agree with Jennifer Carlson that a robust democracy in America depends on the willingness of gun people and non-gun people across the political spectrum to embrace each other, quote, as equal citizens and fellow humans, end quote. Thanks very much to those of you who listened all the way to the end. If I've given you some value in this video, please hit the like button. It helps other people find my work. And if you've read Carlson's book, please leave your thoughts in a comment or 
based on my summary of the book and my take on the book. Also, let me know what you think. Thanks very much, and we'll see you again next time.